Well, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, I've got six o'clock uh, by my clock. Uh, for those of you that weren't here last time, my clock was running behind, so now we are back on time. Uh, tonight, we have a very special guest, Mr. or excuse me, Dr. Josh Jackson with Biosystems and Engineering. And we've talked a lot about hay, but how do we, what, what equipment do we need to use to make this quality hay? So, Dr. Jackson, I am going to turn it over to you, my friend. Uh, thank you, Philip, for that introduction. Uh, thank you, everybody, for coming tonight. And I'll try to do everything I can to hold your attention, attention throughout the presentation. But uh, so first getting off, you know, right off the bat, you know, what is the goals of our hay machinery? And so really, you know, what we're trying to do with the hay machinery is to optimize forage and yield, uh, and for, forage yield and quality for livestock consumption in, in a timely manner, but cost-effective fashion. So trying to get a, a lot of different goals there. So yield and quality, and that's really what we're trying to do, but we have to take it to some other considerations as well. So one of them being the nutritional requirements of cattle or, or whatever livestock it may be. There's a lot of factors which go into consideration of what quality and yield of hay we're gonna need. So cattle will generally consume as a rough calculation about uh, one to 2% of their body weight, uh, depending. And so age will play an important factor is, so if you have a heifer, that is, um, you're asking her to grow, you're asking her to breed, and also lactate, you know, has a calf at side, um, you know, really we want to try to make sure she's getting a lot of the, the groceries that are high quality, if at all possible, so that she can perform the way we need her to. Also think about the level of production. Uh, from a level of production standpoint, you know, a lot of times we encourage our cattle producers to use EPDs, it's like the highest growth weaning weight or yearling weight bulls. But uh, the only way we can actually achieve uh, some of the goals that we set out for those animals is to feed them, feed them to pretty much put the groceries to them. So give them a lot of that hay that's high quality so they can produce. Uh, there might be you know, breed differences. You know, disclaimer, I'm an Angus guy, but you know, traditionally Angus has been smaller than Charolais. So again, that size difference of eating 2% of the body weight, you would expect on typically, or on average, you'd expect the Charolais potentially consume more than an Angus would. However, the size of Angus has increased over time uh, since pretty much the 1970s. Uh, from a physiological standpoint, if we have a cows, and I kind of alluded to this earlier, cows that are lactating or in gestation, uh, they're going to be needing a lot more quality uh, and, and again, a lot more yield. So we have to really be able to provide the hay to them. And environmental conditions. So environmental conditions are going to change. So it's obviously Kentucky. So the temperature, the season, mud. So we dealt with the temperature changes probably about three weeks ago when it got down to freezing, you know, well below freezing, ice, snow, really put a lot of stress and a lot of challenges on the animals. So, you know, that's when I like to go ahead and just throw out extra hay. I was like, that way, if it's there, they want to eat if they can. And they also have additional challenges just this past time just because it was covered over in ice. So it made it a little more challenging for them to get to potentially a one of hay that was stored outdoors. And then uh, especially, you know, this time of year, we also have to deal with, you know, issues with mud. And so you know, I think, you know, Dr. Fifth, when I was going through my animal science class, always said, if you fed them, set them up to fail, they will accommodate you. So we really need to make sure we do everything we can to make the, sure these animals are hitting the production goals that we set out for them. And so this is, uh, you know, for the past, oh, three or four years now, this has been a major issue. Uh, here in Kentucky and across the state, uh, just mud. You know, you can hang up a helicopter putting out hay, as they say. Uh, you know, you get out there, you know, this was with a two-wheel drive tractor, you cannot put out hay. You know, there's problems that can be solved with a four-wheel drive tractor, but that's really not the issue here. The uh, time um, and energy animals are spending to get through the mud, you know, reducing average daily gains by 25 to 37%, and really reducing our other feed intake uh, per pound of gain also by 20 to 30%. So this is off of an ASAB standard, looking at uh, the work requirement of cattle to walk through mud. And so it definitely takes a lot more energy. Um, so they're having to consume more hay just to get to the, you know, just to survive essentially as they're out there in that mess. So 
In this case, it's not really an equipment solution to this type of problem. Uh, there are other, it takes, you know, obviously we have a mud issue there, but uh, it takes alternatives. So this is one, you know, this is not, not a traction solution, but we have, you know, alternative NRCS, or it can be a CAPE project. This was one that was installed by uh, Dr. Morgan Hayes here at the University of Kentucky in, in ag engineering. I have a similar setup at my farm and it's just being able to allow the animals to stand on a solid surface to consume their food. And uh, it makes it a, little, a lot easier to put out hay as well. Placing it close to your hay structure helps. Uh, man manure management is a big uh, challenge with this just because you have to clean it out every two weeks or so. So manure management becomes a lot more of a challenge. There's also a bale grazing or, or a rope, um, that can be done as an alternative to this strategy of more confined feeding versus more dispersed. So bale grazing will be an alternative to this. Um, <clears throat> so we get to our hay machinery operation. You know, we have two main trade-offs when, when we're here on the farm. It's gonna be money or time. So, you know, we have to have at least one or, or both to really uh, achieve the goals we set out for operation and get a lot of hay put down and cut. and uh, obtained in, in a bail fashion of relatively timely manner. Um, and so the ease of operation, you know, it's probably gonna be a lot better with some of the newer equipment, or it should be better with newer equipment because you have better display screens, more electronics, software. Uh, but from a repair and maintenance standpoint, uh, it might be easier. So on the bottom right here, I got a New Holland 467. It might be easier to find parts for that, or it might be a little more difficult uh, depending but you know, the parts that you do get will be a lot cheaper and it's a lot easier to actually work on this hay bond as opposed to the class um, Jaguar up there. But uh, you know, the parts are gonna be different. And you know, one of the things I'd, I'd also state here as well is that uh, for the hay bond, you could probably get another backup you know, or a parts bind for almost more cost effectively than you could parts. And so in that case it might be, you might have two of these New Holland 60, uh, 467 hay binds and then be able to operate relatively easily and have a, a spare parts there on hand as opposed to the cloths, you can't necessarily afford a second cloth Jaguar. Uh, but you know, really, you know, we have to balance our pretty much money and time and what's most important is getting the hay down and up effectively. So, you know, what's what's our main challenges? Um, so here's, you know, pretty much you got the weather, but usually this is what happens whenever you cut hay, you got some storm. You cut hay, it's out there drying, maybe raked up, you got a storm bearing down on you. So there's important considerations for many machine operations and one of them is the time. So how, the speed of operation, how quickly can you get out the hay? Can you put it down and get it back up and get it put in the barn? So speed of operation, so time, number of drying days. So number of drying days, number of days in which you can bail. So that'd be at least three or four days in a row where it's not raining. And so this past year in 2020 was especially a, a challenging year. So we only had about uh, 24 days of a good quality drying or bailing days this past year. So it made a lot, you had to thread that needle as far as getting your hay done. And then you have to deal with at some point, you know, you're gonna have it get rained on, things happen and pop up, shower. You have to deal with harvest losses and there's gonna be phantom losses you'll see in your barn or even when you're storing the hay. So that can be another important consideration. Um, ease of operation, like I said, uh, if you have some newer machinery, it might be a little easier to operate. There's certain inherent trade-offs there. Um, and then the repair, you know, ease of repair and ease of parts acquisition. So, you know, I try to use people who are close by to me as far as dealerships, just so that I can get my parts uh, relatively easily and know that they're, uh, they should have the next day or somewhere close by uh, so I can get my parts. So ease acquisition and ease of repair, something you can actually work on is important. Uh, I want to do a little plug here since we're talking about the challenges of the weather. I want to plug here the UK Ag Weather Center. And so the website's listed there. We have our meteorologist, Matt Dixon. Uh, but this is, and he makes forecasts for the different counties. This is one for Lewis County here. And so the seven day precip is what they're expecting here on the top left. I do like what they have here um, in the I do like with seven day extended forecast just because it tells you the drying conditions. So it tells you those drying conditions over time. And so in July, you can expect it to be pretty good, but you know, he tells you drying conditions and also the sky cover. So how much cloud cover are you going to have that day? So 
those are two fairly important factors because I know um, WKYT, WLAX, and uh, WTVQ here in Lexington, they always say, oh yeah, it's going to be good. It's going to be, it's going to not rain, but they don't tell you if it's going to be sunny or not. So this one actually gives you some indication of how much sunshine you, you could see that day and what type of drying conditions it's going to be. And so uh, UK Ag Weather Center, you know, seems to be a, a good site for information that's localized to, to your county. So it's good for each and every county. Uh, just check out the website, uh, www.agwx.ca.uky.edu. Um, and so one of the one of the challenges here, and so this is some um, data from Matt Dixon here. It kind of gives us the average uh, annual temperature and precipitation here on this scatter plot. So the top right here is above normal precipitation and above normal temperatures. And so this is some of the challenges that we're seeing here uh, over the past several years, is even the past five years really, is that it's going to be a little hotter than than, than uh, average, and we're getting above average precipitation. So it can be a little more challenging to do the hay. So that's something we got to take into consideration. You know, you have maybe narrow windows to actually get stuff done. And so this is this is true um, across the year for every month and for every season. You can see the same pattern in winter, summer, fall, spring. If you break it out, you know, in discrete uh, time series, yeah, you see the same pattern throughout the years. It's above normal temperatures and above normal rainfall. So we're typically seeing for the past couple of years. So something we got to consider. Uh, to that same end, you know, dealing with the challenges, uh, we can see our Kentucky annual precipitation for the past, you know, several years, that floating average is increasing. So we're thinking that, you know, either uh, it's going to keep on that upward trend or on the alternative of that, if it balances out and goes back to the average, then we're going to be experiencing some severe drought conditions. So we don't quite know which one's going to take place, but uh, we can see that if it's continues on that current path, uh, we have to plan for potentially what are, what are more challenging times to actually get our hay up. Uh, at Kentucky annual temperature, it's fluctuating over the years, but on the whole, it's kind of been increasing. So we're just dealing, again, stress, stressing that we have to deal with that warmer, wetter climate that we're gonna be seeing here, potentially, at least what the data is showing. And so that's something we gotta take into consideration. You know, timeliness is going to be really important, I feel like, going forward. Uh, to that end, you know, 70% of the quality is determined by maturity. So 70%, I'm going to state that again, 70% of the quality is determined by maturity. So really, it's just knowing when to cut, you know, so we can get with our low lignin, this is for alfalfa here, alfa oops, alfalfa curve. So low lignin and alfalfa, if you grow that, if you have to extend, if there's rain in the forecast at day 28 when you typically cut, uh, you can actually extend that duration to maybe 35 days and still have the same quality that you would have had and, and slightly, yeah, an additional yields as well. So sometimes, you know, it can be crop dependent, but knowing when to cut is the majority of it. So hopefully Ray Smith and different ones have covered that already. But uh, really, you know, for us from a mach machinery standpoint, just getting out there and being able to do what we need to do. Uh, to that end, we have two main cutting options. So one of them being a disc mower, other one being a sickle bar mower. Uh, and they've made it such that here in the past couple of years, you know, you have quick change blades on your uh, disc mower. Uh, there's ways you can work on your sickle bar mower. It still takes a lot of time, but uh, there's pros and cons to each one of these. So talk about the sickle mower first. You know, main thing is they're lightweight. They operate about 1800 strokes per minute. And it's really your lowest cost option for cutting hay. And it takes the least amount of horsepower. So on average, I think it's about um, 0.5 horsepower according to ASAB specifications per foot. And you know, give or take, uh, I think a variation of 40%. Uh, the only cons is, you know, the really what you're sacrificing here is timeliness. So in heavy crops, it's gonna clog. So that means you have to go slower. You're gonna have that reduced ground speed and your knives are expensive and take a little more time to replace. They do have tools which can help you, uh, one shown in the background in green here, that can help you change those blades out a little faster as opposed to taking the whole bar out, but um, it does take some time. And, but these are kind of your lowest cost option for getting out there and cutting hay. So if you have a smaller farm, 
you know, sickle bar cutter would be the one to maybe think about. Uh, a disc mower. So it's going to be rotating about 3,000 revolutions per minute. So, you know, every, like all your blades need to rotate uh, all the same direction or counter, uh, counter to each other. You can achieve a much higher ground speed, so six to nine miles per hour. It's much, much less likely to clog. Uh, won't be, it's not impossible. It can be done. I've done it once before, but uh, they're much less likely to clog. And you generally need about uh, three to seven horsepower per, per foot of cutting width. So it takes um, at least four times more horsepower than it would a uh, straight up disc cutter. Or I mean, yeah, disc cutter, the knives. Um, your knife life on these, you know, they, they can be, you know, quick change. And so you maybe change your whole bar within a couple minutes. Uh, they, obviously, that's a more expensive option on newer mowers, but uh, so a little easier to change your blades. Uh, you can, if you dull your knives, you know, maybe change them about every 200 acres. Uh, maybe it's going to be somewhat field dependent. If you hit a lot of rocks or a lot of obstacles in your field, you probably want to change them a little sooner as uh, dull knives increase horsepower requirements. Uh, you can partially, you know, just flip them one year uh, for one season after the 200 acres and then flip or re replace as needed. But uh, the only downside to disc mower, it's a, a lot more money is required. So it's going to be a, more costly. So it's a, well, it gives you, saves you a lot of time, but you're going to pay for that uh, in machinery costs. Looking at our conditioner options, you know, we think we have, generally speaking, we have two main options here. We're either going to go with rubber rollers or looking at flails to uh, condition our material and help it dry down faster. So, you know, preparing these two options, I always tell people, you know, it's like, it's a, uh, it's a fight, but the better one in my mind is going to be crop dependent. Um, I, I, I'd lean towards the rollers just because you can do your alfalfa, your high value crop. You need to make sure you take care of those leaves. And the best way to do that is to use your rubber rollers. It won't beat and knock the leaves off, which is where most of your value is in that crop. Uh, pearl millet, Sudan grass, sorghum Sudan grasses. Um, if you have a flail, if you're doing just grasses, it's good for you know just grasses and Bermuda grass. But um, you know if you're looking at doing both grasses and alfalfa, I'm definitely you know, suggesting strongly suggesting roller conditioners. Uh, we look at uh, fuel power requirements of each. So we look at a standard cutter bar. Uh, a disc mower with a roller conditioner, a cutter bar with a roller, and a, excuse me, disc with uh, flails. And so looking at our fuel consumption, so it's gonna be for these, it takes a lot more juice, a lot more gallons per hour, a little more horsepower to actually get going with your uh, flail. It's gonna take the most energy, most PTO power, and then your cutter bar is gonna take the least. Uh, gallons per hour is gonna be, obviously higher with your disc, disc bind and then higher with the even flails. Uh, and you can actually look at fuel consumption. If we're looking at fuel consumption, this was um, actually went down as you increased your miles per hour. So it got a little more efficient the faster you went and your gallons per ton, you know, varied. But was, in, this, in this case, it was actually lower with um, using the, uh, the cutter bar. However, the, the caveat to this is, um, so a lot of this you know, work was done in the 80s, and this was actually done in Michigan, a Michigan-based study where they're doing it in alfalfa. They did the horsepower requirements uh, to figure out the similar horsepower was done on dynamometer to make it that was similar fuel use to what they were seeing in the field for the tractors. Uh, it's how they calculated that average PTO difference. But uh, one of the things is, you know, one of the flaws of the studies if we had to run again was these, these are more hay bind speeds in my mind. You're not actually taking full advantage of that seven miles, six, seven miles per hour that you could achieve or, or higher potentially with that um, disc roller or disc with flails. So this is kind of, in my mind, skewed towards the, the hay bind cutter. But, you know, keeping in mind, this will generally hold true. Your flails, what I've seen Typically in research, your flail is going to take always more energy than your rollers will. Typically, uh, in you know, increasing the speed obviously decreases gallons per acre by thirteen percent. Make sure I 
say that. So roller spacing. Uh, really, for the roller spacing, uh, distance between the rollers should be about an eighth of an inch. You know, you really don't want them touching. That's not ideal because then you're, you're going to be wasting additional horsepower if you're just pushing the material, uh, the rollers against themselves. It should be adjusted for the stems of the various crops. And you, there's usually um, one adjustment per side on most of your roller, uh, your conditioner. So really trying to make sure there's that spacing between the two should be about an eighth of an inch. So they shouldn't quite touch, uh, match your stem and should be in your manual, you know, exactly where you set that, but typically about an eighth of an inch. Uh, roller timing typically shouldn't need to be adjusted. Again, we're trying to make sure it doesn't hit the front, front or back of your roller. So they shouldn't touch and there should be, kind of as shown here, spaced correctly. Uh, so your adjustment for your roller gaps, it's on New Holland uh, 1411. It'll be on the left and right side. And you move your, um, it'll be right there, that bolt there, or that bolt there, excuse me, bolt there, you can adjust for your roller gap. On your roll pressure, it's gonna be in the back there, torsion spring, and your um, roller timing, shouldn't really need to be adjusted, but you can get into that, uh, if you're looking at it from behind, that left side uh, of your 1411s, and you can adjust some um, uh, bolts on your shaft. Uh, and so roll pressure and your spacing, really, you know, the best way to measure those is, is to also uh, get out there and look at your crop. To see what you have available. Uh, look for your crimps or crushed. It should be drooping or wilting. You know, most of your stamps need to be crushed or crimped. So, you know, showing that you have effective compression taking place. Uh, less than 5% of your leaves should be showing brown spots. And so if it's under condition, you know, really readjust and increase your roll pressure or your um, check your roll gap, make sure it's where it needs to be. If it's over conditioned, you know, maybe broken stems or damaged or stripping leaves, maybe go ahead and try reducing that. So um, shouldn't typically need to be adjusted, but uh, you know, get out there and just pretty much check your crop as you go from maybe field to field and make sure it's performing the way it should be. So if it's under condition, really it's just taking horsepower and not really doing anything. So. If it's over condition, we're probably using too much horsepower in the case. So really make sure that's often operating where it should be. Uh, flail conditioner, you know, really we're trying to, again, achieve the same goal, crimp the biomass, strip some of the wax off of there um, and, and, and increase that drying rate. So we want, want to adjust the hood above the flail motor so we can, or we can add a liner to help increase that conditioning or adjust it closer as well. So that, that was kind of what you can do for your flails to make sure that they're operating in an effective manner. Uh, think, thinking about our cutting height and, and angle, um, there can be different skid shoe kits available. Some are adjustable. So on your newer ones, it's adjustable. There's some for high stubble, there's biomass kits. They can be um, somewhat expensive. Um, some are machine specific settings, but you know, for some of the new ones, you can, they're adjustable. On some of the older machines, there may not be uh, various sizes of skid shoes or plates. So we have to um, maybe make that sacrifice a cut a little lower or higher or whatever the machine is at that point. Um, you know, they, they really, we'd like for it to be adjustable, but, you know, sometimes it's not possible. And your disc, your uh, disc cutter is just a disc cutter with a, a attached to a three point top link. Uh, so you can adjust that sometimes to uh, change your angle of your cut. If it's a field with a lot of rocks, you know, I typically suggest to producers, you know, angle it back. So hopefully it can um, go over the rocks more easily. And so maybe it won't hit down and, and really dig into it and really damage a lot of your blades and possibly your machine. So if you're in a, a field that's relatively rocky, I know Limestone, limestone is fairly common. It uh, just seems to grow when we have winters like this where it um, gets fairly cold for a number of days. You know, we get that frostal heaving. Somehow the big rocks just seem to come to the surface. So uh, if they're filled with a lot of rocks, you know, maybe that'd be something to think about adjusting your angle, make sure you're not gonna damage your machinery. Uh, Coming come to tethers. So for me, tethers are a paradox. So it's, it's a challenge just because on wet years, you should have plenty of hay. And so the actual value of the hay 
will go down in essence. And so then do you really need to spend, be spending additional diesel fuel and time on something that's gonna be low, a little lower value? On your dry years, if it's a drought year, it's gonna be really dry and you don't really need it, potentially. If it's, if it's gonna be dry anyway, if you're experiencing drought conditions, then you don't need it because it's dry anyway. But you know where the paradox is, so here's the paradox, is if you're selling high quality horse hay or high quality hay, if you're selling hay or you want you have goats, you want to avoid issues with mold, then it's almost something you have to, that you have to have. So that's why it's a paradox. So in those wet years, if you have animals which are a little more sensitive, and even you know, cattle like to still produce a high quality hay, you know, in a timely fashion, then yeah, maybe, maybe a tether would be something that is needed because it reduces that time window for drying, but it does, you know, you just have to balance it out. It's going to take time and diesel fuel. It's just the thing. So for me, it's a paradox. It, it's kind of one of those necessary evils. I don't necessarily like to use them, but I understand the importance of them, especially when we're, especially in the spring cut, if you have some uh, rye grass or some, or if you're able to get something in May, you know, as well, really in that time period, you really need to drive fast because you don't have a, because the windows close fairly quick on you in the spring. And so having a tether can be important. So I know, I know I'm talking about both sides of my mouth on this one, but you know, there are paradox, but I, I think, you know, if I had to choose, you know, you almost need one, but I'd rather not use it. It'd be my thought. Uh, looking at a, a rake. So there's three different kinds of rakes. Generally what we see is a bar rake, wheel rake, or a rotary rake. So the bar uh, top left here, we have the side delivery. Uh, typically, it yeah, can be good for crops if it's wet, can be good for forward soybeans. Uh, if you get a dolly wheel, they can better for a better turn radius. I will say it helps to have um, not the most skilled, but a somewhat skilled operator because it can take somewhat of a learning curve uh, for younger individuals to learn, you know, how to properly uh, rake a field, but, you know, it's not, not impossible. Uh, but just making sure that they don't leave the big old dovetails at the end. So Dolly Will can help get a better, little better turn radius, uh, makes it easier on the baler guy uh, if they're not very good at clean up the end of the rows. But, you know, with the, with the bar rake, you can, well, if you want to merge three rows into, uh, a couple rows into another, each other, or, uh, merge a couple rows, this can be done relatively simple with this or turn even turn a row over that may have gotten rained on. Uh, you can do it with the bar rake. Uh, wheel rakes, you know, I really like the V rakes and they have some of their side delivery, but V uh, mainly gets you that, that speed advantage. So the baler, if you can get, if you have the available labor, uh, you can go out there, start raking and pretty much following and your hay is dry, falling right behind them with the, with the baler. So I can see where wheel rakes have a lot of advantage and a little, a little more fuel efficiency as well because they're usually wider up to 21, 28 or potentially wider than our bar rakes. You can get two bar rakes, but they're gonna be a little heavier than potentially your B, B wheel rake. Then you also have your rotary, rotary rake there. Uh, might be a little less aggressive on some of your alfalfas. Uh, gets a little more fluff, a little more aer aeration between the, uh, the rows. Uh, some producers like it, you know, if that's one of those, if it works for you, it works for you. That's another option that's available. Uh, so with the wheel rakes, you know, something you got to think about, even the bars, you know, you know, hay can wrap up if it's, if it's a little wet, it can wrap up or even some old string wrap up around your bearings on your wheel rakes. Doesn't seem like a big issue. It's not going to stop you. But it's not going to be ideal. Anytime you got extra grasses, or string right there on something that's rotating and moving. Uh, it's gonna grind away at it, maybe, and heat up your bearing, then it's eventually gonna fail a little quicker. So just something to keep in mind, you know, be sure to clean off everything for, before you go to field, in between fields, uh, something to keep in mind. It's not gonna stop you, but it's not ideal. Uh, in this case, you know, this was a, got a lower cost auction. I think they got the Farm Bureau auction, I think coming up this weekend, I believe. Uh, down in Ironworks Pike, I believe. It's going to be all online this year, I think. But, you know, if you get a lower cost rake, you know, you, your back of your rake is going to see a lot of that pressure. Their back wheels of that rake is seeing a lot of pressure from everything from 
the size coming into those back wheels, it's gonna see a little more pressure. If you got a lower cost rake, maybe there's a, a reason that it's lower cost. Um, something like this, you know, won't end your day, but uh, it's definitely not gonna make you happy. So uh, maybe some of them aren't gonna be as resilient as others, you know, do your research as far as what you need to buy. Find a reputable dealer to hopefully stand behind their stuff. So for side delivery bar rake, it's good for, so personal preference is gonna be the B rake. But your side delivery is good for your thick, wet crops. Uh, you're gonna get a little less ash content. And reading a couple of the articles, um, we actually saw the ash content uh, was similar between the bar rake, and this is across uh, three states over three, or three or four different years and a couple different cuttings. The ash content between the bar rake, V rake, and um, the rotor, rotary rake was very similar. So uh, sometimes, you know, this can be a little, get you a little less. It just depends on the study, how they set it up, but uh, something to think about because cows don't like uh, sand in their salad. So it doesn't really benefit them very much if you have a hash content. If you're pulling up just dirt and throwing there. Uh, I do like the V-Rake just because it's faster, wider, and the baler can follow directly behind it if it's dry. And it's just, just a whole lot better field efficiency from my standpoint. So uh, with a kicker, make sure it has a kicker wheel in my mind. So it's getting that bottom that's going to be underneath. If it's if it's not perfectly between two of your rows. Uh, get a kicker wheel so it kicks it over and make sure everything is going to be well aerated. So, you know, for hay drying strategies. So, you know, what we have at this point in the game, so getting a wide windrow. So, hey, hey, if you have a 12 foot cutter, put in a nine foot swath versus a six foot swath, it's going to dry 35% faster. So, definitely, if we put it a much wider swath, that's kind of what's shown here in the bottom right graph. Uh, we can get, you know, a lot fired faster drying down if we throw that hay out as much as we can, ideally, you know, because we, we're really get, taking advantage of a lot more that solar energy, watts per square meter. So taking advantage of that solar energy for the drying effect. So we can spread it out more, hopefully get a little more aeration taking place, get a, a much better dry down. Uh, cutting height, uh, I really like three to four inches of grass double, allow for better drying on the bottom. I know some of the guys at the Falfa conference were talking about doing uh, two inches. Yeah, that, that, that works for them. I think it could work. You know, if it works, if you're doing alfalfa pure stand, if you get some of the grasses in there, you're definitely going to want to cut a little higher as you go throughout the season if you, if you have alfalfa and orchard grass. But I, I typically like three to four inches for the grasses. Seems like it comes back a little better uh, and, help, and helps it dry as well. Uh, drying rate, you know, it's going to be. 15 to 25% greater uh, with a conditioner. And for large stems, you know, rollers can save a day, six can save a day over flails. So I really think, you know, roller conditioners in my mind are gonna be the better way to go. And having some type of hay conditioning, you know, whether it's rollers or flails definitely helps. Um, and the other, you know, drying strategy is the tether. So I said, it's, it's almost a necessary evil but it, it can increase your drying rate by 15 to 30%. And it's best to use in the morning, ideally when that dew's still on there, because again, we're trying to protect those leaves. You might get a little less, get a little less shatter, or you, you'll, you will get less shatter that way if you have it uh, well, the next morning or, or still a few hours after cutting to reduce the leaf shatter. So something to think about, but it can save some time. So all this is just to reduce that window that it takes to dry that hay down so you can go ahead Gee, the next step is our balers. So this is one that Vermeer had, had shown at the farm show uh, a couple years ago. What, what do we think about with their balers? I always encourage producers, you know, I know, it, I know it's extra money. It's easy to say, spend money when it's not your money, but uh, I, I went ahead and invested in a wide pickup as well, just because it allows you to pick up a wider wind row. Um, and, it's, and it can be nice for V-Rakes, because sometimes they don't, Throw them directly, you know, doesn't stack it too awful high, makes it a little wider for the B rake. Yeah, this can be a good row. Um, wide pickup is good for your B rakes. And it can help you make square shoulder bales. So you can make sure you're, you're weaving enough to get a good square shoulder on your bales. Um, and, and it also, again, takes into account some of if you 
depending on the help that you have for your rake. Um, well, I'll tell, I'll tell a story. I have a niece, and so whenever she would uh, rake for me, it looked like a serpent, a snake going through the field. So it's this big S almost. So, you know, wide shoulder bales can help pick up uh, the rake person's slack. Uh, so looking at bale or size uh, considerations. So the horsepower, the bigger your bale, the more horsepower is going to require. Pretty much makes sense. Because uh, we can see that here. So it goes from 60 horsepower to 80 horsepower. We go from a forward by five to five by six. Now how, this is just the horsepower, PDO horsepower required to make a bale. It doesn't mean, you know, you can get up the, because you're up there in Lewis County and adjacent counties are going to be a fair number of hills. So it doesn't account for being able to stop or actually get the tractor up the hill. So in that case, you might need actual PTO horsepower of the tractor, maybe around 130 or more, more or somewhere around 130, maybe more depending on how, how big your hills are. Uh, as you increase the bale size, you know, you're going to, like I said, increase that power requirement. But the one good thing is you have fewer bales to handle. So if we look at down here at the bottom right and see a four by five bale, you know, it's going to produce about 80 cubic feet of bale. However, if you take up to a five by six, you've essentially just well, almost, almost double it. So a five by six is almost double the size of your four by five. So that means there's going to be, you have more hay there, fewer bales to handle. And so you have also have a higher capacity when you're bailing, you can do a higher capacity of bales increased tumps per hour. It's going to, but with those bigger bales does come the increased um, challenges that you have when you're trying to move and transport those bales. Uh, it's more effective when you're putting out two bales to your cows, but it's a lot more challenging to go down the road um, if you're hauling them on a wagon. So four, so four foot wide bales are easy to transport uh, and, let, and to some degree, are, are, are easier to transport. And I think maybe you guys, hopefully far enough away from Cincinnati, it's not too much of a problem, but uh, if you get closer, I think towards Kenton County, you're probably getting closer to smaller four by five bales, just so you're on your side and don't have to deal with issues from Cincinnati individuals. Uh, bale density. So bale density is influenced by um, potentially the size of your baler, size of your, you know, amount of material you have going in there, crop, moisture, travel speed, your baler settings, your uh, baler manufacturer, your maintenance maintenance that's performed on the baler, a lot of different factors go into it. So, um, you know, ideally we have to like to have it as dense as bale as possible, but still allow the animals to be able to pull off the material as needed. Um, and, and there's some balers, you know, typically we've always thought, you know, as you go slower, you're going to increase your bale density on some of the bales, we actually see some of the fine leaves are actually getting chopped off as we're going. So, you know, in some cases, actually increasing speed was increasing on some balers, on some balers, increasing speed was actually increasing bale density. So it's a little bit of variation, uh, it's crop dependent, check your settings, but, um, you know, it's something we, we have to also think about, you know, looking at our density. In this case, we had a square bale bust apart on us, a big square bale. Um, so looking at bale size and bale transport, um, you know, really think about it from a, a number of trips standpoint, we're going back and forth. Obviously we do the square bales are a little easy to, big square bales are a little easy to transport. But, uh, you know, looking at our five by sixes, you know, looking at the same volume of hay, uh, if we're thinking about it per acre, you know, we get maybe seven bales per acre on our five by sixes, as opposed to, you know, we're getting 12 of our four by five. So, those four by fives got to handle them a lot more as opposed to our bigger bales. So I, I prefer if I'm feeding cattle, if it's cattle, I prefer a five by six. However, you know, there's individuals for feeding horses, something like, or another livestock species, you know, maybe the four by five is the only thing they can handle. Maybe they don't have the tractor to handle the bigger bales. And so like on this, this tractor here, the Puma, it actually has a, a weight box in the back so it can handle those two bales in the front. Um, it just, you know, but matching the capacity of your bales to your tractor size is going to be important. Uh, we think about our wrapping options. So we got Sicilian twine, plastic twine to the edge 
uh, net wrap and you have the cover the edge net wrap. Uh, both, I think Deer and Vermeer, last time I checked, had um, cost calculators. So that's something we need to evaluate as far as what would be the best option for your operation. Some bailers are allow you to do both, which I think is maybe the option to go. Um, and there's differences for storing. We'll kind of get into that on this slide. So we think about net wrap versus twine. Twine, traditionally, there's a couple of years where it wasn't. Traditionally, it had been cheaper, uh, maybe a little easier to feed. Might be a personal preference, but uh, easier to feed. But yeah, easy to feed from the standpoint of I can put a bale out there with the Sicilian twine and everything. The cattle eat it. I don't worry about it too much. It degrades over time. However, you know, we get in the net wrap, it is 30% faster and there's ash there in the field. Well, it was actually for Shinner's, uh, some of Shinner's work, but it's 30% faster. Uh, it adds a cost to your baler. So, you know, initial cost, you know, might be 15 to 25% more for your newer balers. So it could be five to 8,000, could be, I'm not saying it's gonna be every time. Uh, for some of your used balers, I haven't really, some of them I haven't really seen much of a difference in the baler cost between you know, net wrap and, and twine. So on some of your used balers, you, know, you might not see that difference. And so then there might not be, an, they may, may not see that advantage, but uh, you, you get better bales. And so by better bales, I mean the better stored bales store better. So you were seeing less losses over time. So we can store these a little better outdoors. You get less material, less uh, wicking from the bales, pulling uh, moisture up from the ground and it's able to shed moisture a little better. Um, and you got higher per bale initial cost potentially uh, that you know that that'll fluctuate with the seasons with the years but traditionally or at least in the past couple of years they had been relatively similar but you know one of the main challenges is not it you know mentioned it about three weeks ago we had that ice storm trying to get the net wrap after it's been iced is almost impossible you can hit it with a hammer crowbar whatever you have and it's still going to stick on there like glue so really you know, if we, I like to uh, net, if it's stored outside, I like to net wrap some and also have some of our string tied. Uh, or, you know, ideally what you have is you have your hay stored indoors and it's not a concern. You don't have to deal with the ice. Just go and um, feed your hay. But I will say the time that you save in the field, so 30% faster in the field, you're going to spend it when you feed it just because you, you, know, you save a minute in the field, you'll spend a minute cutting it off, taking it off uh, whenever you feed it. So it's kind of a catch-22 on net wrap. But you know, net wrap is faster than twine tie or you know, than your twine tie. So it's going to be two to four revolutions for net wrap as opposed to you know 10 times that, 20 to 30 for your twine tie. So looking at you know from a four by six standpoint, a four by four by five essentially, you know, you can see that your tons per hour is going to be your bales per hour is going to increase with net wrap versus twine. So in this case, you have 20 seconds versus 47 seconds. And on your much larger baler, you're you know, they're making almost a five by six or five by five in this case, um, you go from 22 seconds to 75 seconds. And you've increased you know, slightly that ton per hour, at least for the net wrap, increase that tons per hour to 15.5 tons per hour as opposed to your 14.3. On your smaller. So, the difference between your baler, so go to bigger baler, you're seeing a little more tons per hour. And you're also seeing uh, as you go from your twine to your net wrap, you're definitely doing a lot more, your 30% more per hour. So, it assumes, and yeah, it assumes a constant mass flow rate into the baler. It's a relatively uniform field. Uh, so, there's also, you know, something about you, you got your big inline square balers, you know, picks up. Material pushes into a pre-chamber. Then once that's full, the stuffer trips and pushes the material into the barrel chamber. The plunger forces it down to converging sections. Um, you know, for these bigger baler, you know, density is controlled through the converging sections. Uh, density is limited by the pretty much the plunger force and your twine strength. So really, it's not the plunger force per se, because uh, in the studies we did with biomass, we were trying to achieve a density of over uh, 12 pounds per cubic foot. Uh, really, it was the twine strength. The twine strength will limit you. So you can you can make the bale as dense as possible, but 
but your strings couldn't hold it once it got outside the baler. So they were just snap. And once the first one went, they all went. So uh, there are some limitations for density. So you, you generally be around, uh, depending on your baler, eight to 10 pounds per cubic foot, generally speaking. Uh, so used balers. So looking at some used balers, you know, what we have here is um, John Deere, John Deere 510. And so the horse park auction, something like this would probably go for um, probably around 1500, just because it's a bigger baler, made major bigger bales, but it's, you know, so it'd be something that a lot of people couldn't quite utilize on their farm. And it was older bales, closed throat. So it's a little harder to feed the material in there and it's just a little more challenging. But you know, there's gonna be challenges with some of the used equipment. But so personal story of the John Deere 510 Baylor, like it didn't have a monitor. So you think not a big deal, but you spend 50% of your time looking behind you when there's no monitor. So you, you had to man look, look at it and watch it. And so you, you might miss a sinkhole. There's always it is it's definitely wasn't as easy as having a monitor. And I'd say you can never bail wet hay because at the first sign of too much moisture, we just clog, wrap around those two big rollers, and you have to get your utility knife out and go to town. So especially fun August and July days when it's nice and hot and humid. And so, and then in that hay with gloves and just, just wasn't a fun time. So, you know, I think in my mind, I wouldn't go too cheap on a baler. I mean, you can, if you're only doing a couple bales, something like this could work. If you're doing like a low number of bales, you don't need a whole lot. This can be a functional baler. It'll put it in, put in a bale form, but, um, there were other, other challenges with it is if you increased your belt, uh, your density on your baler too much, you'd break a lot of belts. And then your other challenge would be um, if you made it too loose, whenever you went to feed in the wintertime, it would just flow open like a mush, mushroom and just hay would go everywhere before you even got to the hay ring. So uh, even that was even after storing in the barn. So th that, you know, personal story is, you know, I think a lot of the newer balers would be the preferred method to go. I mean, maybe within the past 20 years uh, would be acceptable time range for getting a good quality baler. Uh, so some of the newer balers, so they do have, you know, if you're going to, I want a much better baler. So they have the ISO bus monitor. You, if you go for that route and they have your standalone bale monitor uh, that's specific for each baler. So the ISO bus, uh, it's gonna be a little more spendy, let's say, because you have to request that option on your actual tractor you're purchasing a newer, so it's going to be available on your newer tractors. You have to request that actual um, ISO bus on your baler as well. But it, lim it eliminates the need for a separate monitor. It allows for uh, a common multi monitor for multiple implements and it provides more control. So for the newer balers, it actually can automatically stop, wrap the bale, and auto eject the bale. So it can make, you know, if you're looking at it from a, a stress standpoint or user comfort standpoint, it definitely is a lot better. Uh, there's a lot higher cost to it, but or not a lot. There's going to be an increased cost to it, but it's something you think about, and they have it all available on the newer balers. So the ISO bus, it's really just a, a standard communication protocol. Uh, for the ones for, for ag, it's going to be the ISO 11783 code, code or standard. It allows for that interconnectivity, and so uh, the visual terminal, terminal is going to be your human interface, and so the ISO bus 3 allows for that automation to take place. So if you really want something that's automated, uh, that, that'd be where you get that ISO bus three. Uh, something to think about still, so you know, you still gotta watch and some of them do have moisture sensors, um, but you know, gotta watch your bale moisture. It's kind of hard to see in this picture, but the center of that bale is black. And when we went and fed that bale, it was black, but it was one of those, they, they you cut hay one day, and then as soon as you got done cutting hay, they were calling for rain like two days from then. So we had to put it up and weren't able to get it wrapped. And so it got hot. And so you fed that bale and that, that core of that bale was black. And so you lost a lot of your quality in that bale because uh, a lot of it was just being tied up through that uh, process of the breakdown. So really watch your moisture um, and have a good alternative strategy for I, you know, try not to get it wet, but sometimes things are gonna happen. Uh, so your, your maintenance strategy. So for general maintenance strategy, so what we generally try to look for is um, 
Main strategy is going to be to you got one of three options. You can either run to failure, you can do preventive maintenance, or and then sometimes just to deal with it as life happens. So those are your three main options. When we're budgeting for repairs, um, so this is one of the things we're budgeting for repairs. It's one of the first things I try to allocate for um, maintenance and repairs. So it's an ASAB standard. It generally gives you an idea of 5% of the overall value of your equipment should be allocated for your repair budget annually. It doesn't mean that you're going to use it every year. It just means that it could happen. So maybe one year you're doing just fine, don't have any repairs. But the next year you blow an injector pump or your injector pump goes, you blow a tire, you know, engine drops a valve, who knows what. So you know, just trying to plan and allocate for those events, you know, they generally say anywhere five to 10%. So if you have two to three tractors, you know, I assume that might be worth $100,000, depending on how much you spend on tractors, a rake, 7,000, a baler, maybe you spent 40,000. That's all, it's all a little towards the higher end in my, in my mind, but uh, skid steer, or, skid steers are kind of one of those pieces of equipment in my mind, they're worth it to have, uh, gives you some dynamic capabilities. And that's not, kind of beyond the scope of this presentation, but I think skid steers are an effective tool to have on the farm. Um, a wagon, you know, hay wagon in your truck and other costs. I'm thinking you, you might be planning for 10 to 20,000, just planning for that in your bu annual budget. And then it, it, maybe I think you might actually spend maybe seven or eight, seven or five to seven on the repairs, ideally. Uh, but, you know, that's something you got to take in consideration because things do break. And hydraulics are expensive, gears are expensive, everything has got a cost to it. So coming back to it, the run to failure strategy. So, you know, as this is a good strategy for something like a light bulb. And so the reason why it is is because nothing, oh, as long as it wasn't the only one you had on the tractor, um, you know, nothing, nothing bad should happen if the light bulb goes out, you know, on your front end or whatever it may be. Uh, it doesn't pose an immediate safety risk and has a minimal effect on production. Minimal. So that's when you, this is how you use run to failure. It has a minimal effect on production for it to be successful. Uh, and also for it to be a successful strategy, you really, really need to have labor and parts on hand to repair it. So if it was a hose, a spare hose, tire, teeth, whatever it may be, uh, to replace fairly quickly. So, you know, some of the hydraulic hose you run to failure, some of your teeth on your equipment, you might run to failure. But uh, improper application is going to cost you money and time. So I always like this one because it's kind of the Google, it was the Google Earth. It was like one of our tractors out there broke down in the middle of the field just because it blew a blew a line, like a little, you can't see it, the little streak in the middle of the field. But uh, run to failure, if you're running to failure, it kind of dictates uh, where, where and when the failure occurs. So it wasn't quite ideal. It's better than a mud covered mud lot, but uh, it's not as good as it could have been when we have like a shop where there's tools and everything else handily available. So it could have been replaced in February, not June. So run to failure, it has to have a minimal effect. If you're gonna use this maintenance strategy, minimal effect on your production. Um, so preventive maintenance. So maintenance strategies, you know, preventive maintenance, you know, planning ahead for failures um, can be fixed without any production issues. So you know something's broken. So in this case, the steering, on a Ford 8600 steering orbital and motor, uh, whatever you want to call it, was or was a uh, was down essentially. So we had to, you know, it's critical the operation function must be maintained. It must be the same for an axle or any other component where you can't uh, wing it. Uh, the likelihood of a failure increases with time. So we went from adding a little bit of fluid every couple months to we're adding fluid almost daily, and it's like this is the point where we got to do something. So. Coincide with downtime. I really like to do these kind of work in February and March. You know, it's, it's when you're feeding hay, but I got different tracks to feed my hay with. So um, if I can take one down, really you take it down in February and, and in March and not May and June when I'm trying to get hay done or hay up. So, uh, you know, because coincides with downtime, obtain, obtain parts ahead of time. So that was the other key was just obtaining parts ahead of time. So you work on it quickly and effectively. And I actually, actually made that my wife's centerpiece put on the table it's like it looks like uh, flowers or something doesn't it but she, she didn't think it was a good valentine's day centerpiece but teach their own and then then as i talked about as things happen uh you know unplanned repairs so this is the 48 600 just has a flat tire so all the fluid came out of it and the tire went down it's just 
it just, just things happen sometimes. And so with those, you just have to run with the punches. And it, it, it's just really like Murphy's Law. Uh, whenever you put a lot of hay down and the parts store is closed at six o'clock, that's when things will happen. Well, that's when you notice it. So uh, sometimes you just have to play with it, I guess. But I do like to try to have, you know, spare parts on hand or whatever I can to typically try to work on it. So for your, for your hay wagon, so if your hay wagon, uh, we're moving the hay, it's not gonna be used all the time, but uh, I like to go ahead and put the little valves on here uh, to, so I can know like inflation sensors, just because I give everybody a gauge. I used to have a gauge in every truck and somehow it gets lost uh, or something happens, nobody checks the tires till they get out there. And then you have to deal with issues, which costs us time, downtime. And it's just a big hassle to get, get uh, a tank out there. So really, you know, making sure I have valve stem caps to tell me what my tire, I can just walk around real quick, check the tires uh, quickly and effectively. And so for my help can also do the same. But if I know there's an issue, I can say, well, you didn't check the tires. I can see that right off the bat. Um, and the other issue, you know, I have some of those older um, hay wagons is you had that old kind where if it was, it was actually a tube, uh, a tube and a sleeve. And so it's sitting there and I have that circle there because on those older hay wagons, there's just a tube and a sleeve. It would just sit there and rub on that weld, rub on that weld, rub on that weld and just be a friction point until inevitably failure happened. So I had that at least once and I put something on top of that well, to put a little metal plate on top of it. It was like, well, I'll just rub on this plate and say anything happened again. So really after that, yeah, I went to the one that has the ball hitch. This kind of works a little better. Uh, it actually, uh, when I should drive down the road, it actually gives you a little less feedback on the sound standpoint. So um, in my mind, you know, this type of ball hitch works better for when you have your hay wagons. Uh, for bale transport, you know, Five foot wide, five foot wide bales, you're gonna take up a lot of road. Actually, if it's one lane road, you're gonna take up the whole road. But what I found, you know, hazard lights are on eBay for about $200, uh, smaller hazard lights. And they've been fairly effective, at least in Mercer County, you know, getting people to realize, you know, I had my truck flashers on, I had my lights on, but I finally put this on there and people were able to realize, oh, he's, you know, passed with caution. And so really, you know, I looked up the KRS and there was no, um, guideline against, you know, putting this onto your vehicle. So, you know, just lets other vehicles know that they should pass with caution when you have a, a hay wagon. So if you got the big wide hay wagon, hopefully it'll slow down and know that it's, it's going to be a little treacherous. Um, generally speaking, you know, in this case, hay spears break. Um, I'm typically suggesting, you know, so this is one of those operator and you got people you're working with or family, you know, things happen. So pan please are nice to have. This was a speed related issue, trying to do a task quickly and they, they ran into the ground without thinking about it. So um, having plan Bs are good. Thinking about our uh, Baylor belt life, uh, you know, thinking about when to replace potentially, uh, it really depends. If all your of all your hay assets, this is the one that needs to be stored inside. So this and your square baler. Um, so it, and it really needs to be stored inside. So the amount of stretching and fraying will help you determine, you know, when, when the belt needs to be replaced. So ideally, you know, foreign materials really do what's gonna break it. So if you, you know, tell your rake, person raking, you know, I try to, generally when you'll have an issue, so raking along the field edges, if there's trees or limbs, especially with the ash trees and then with ash borer, a lot of limbs coming down, they might rake it up and it goes to your baler, knocks out a belt. So generally, you know, try to suggest producers, you know, from a life standpoint, replace them all at once. However, however, I do understand, because last time I went to buy belts, I was like, I want to replace them all at once. They told me the cost and I was like, I want to replace two because that's expensive. <laughs> so, you know, what's ideal and what's practical, you know, might be, might be two different things. Ideally, like to replace them all at once, but things happen. Um, thinking about you know hydraulic hose failures, you know there's there's numerous ways in which that can happen. Uh, you, you really want to be careful around hydraulic hoses because 
if it's, it can pretty much, if the hydraulic hose is under pressure and it gets a leak in it, it's pretty much like a hypodermic needle and there's no good way to get that out of your system. I don't, I don't think there is a way to get it out of your system. And it's not a good thing. So, you know, be careful around your hydraulic hoses, you know, especially you've got tube erosion, dry, dry aged, dry air or aged air. You know, maybe you went past the minimum bed special minimum bed radius, uh, insertion depth wasn't quite right on there, improper assembly, heat age, brazen, there's, there's a number of different ways they can fail. So, you know, just keep an eye on them and replace as needed. Um, and, and for your hydraulic system, you know, really, um, you know, I, I like to suggest to producers, you know, getting dust caps put on there, uh, reduces potential contaminant load that your filter has to face. Uh, compared to a hydraulic system, it's relatively cheap and takes literally less than a minute. Um, when, I, when I was growing up, actually we had, to, um, dad always told me, we had to actually go out there and clean them off with a paper towel. It's like, if you want your days to be long, the land of the Lord's given you. He said, you gotta go out there and clean your hydraulic hoses before you hook up any piece of equipment. And so we did. And so we got to college, apparently not everybody did that. But uh, as for us, that was that was part of the law. That was 11th commandment. Uh, and so sprockets, you know, you need to also inspect for wear. So they can be uh, broken, chipped, missing teeth. Uh, those are fairly easy to justify and go ahead and replace. Uh, wobbly sprocket, again, wobbly sprocket, worn keyway, go ahead and replace. Uh, what I typically see, you know, kind of one of those things, and sometimes you uh, put the hands in front of your eyes so you don't see it, but the hook teeth. Um, you know, really, if you get that hook teeth, it looks like a saw blade. That's when you also need to replace it. You get that depth. So in this case, the depth of X in that Y direction, if it's greater than about a tenth of the Y, um, you really need to replace that, um, ideally. So you're, it's, it's pretty warm. So replacing that, I know. And I know it's not going to be cheap because I always, when I go in there, talk to deer, whoever it may be, Case, Assy, you know, I'd always ask them, like, I get a price for something like that. And they say, well, do you want to replace it? It's like, well, how much does it cost? And tell me some absorbent numbers. Like, does it run without it? They always say no. So I was like, well, I'm guessing I'm going to need one then. So I'm going to buck up and pay them, pay the piper. But, you know, roller chains. So your roller chains, you know, they can be over tightened. And so you're putting a, a, over overexertion on your shaft and your support. And on the opposite side of that, if you don't have enough tension in it, well, you get that vibration, that slack, that whip, and that's really going to decrease your chain life. And so, you know, we've got to think about, we got to be right there in that middle, middle where we still have, you know, 2% of the distance to the center. So really this third one here is kind of be ideal for what we're trying to do. Um, and then, you know, getting some poor mesh, if we're getting poor mesh on those gears, we also want to think about replacing our, our roller chain. There is, you know, most chains will run with about 2% elongation. Uh, there are ways in which you can measure, measure it. Um, we measure distance between two pins or 10 pins, excuse me, then compare it to the specified length. There are, are maybe certain components, if you had a conveyor, might not be as important, but, um, it's something to think about. Um, and we, we look about at our roller chain, you know, think about it, it's overloaded. You can see this top plate is definitely overloaded. Another example where it unzips or the pin breaks, that's, that's an indication we're definitely overloading our material here. Uh, some other issues. So we have here, uh, if you got a tight joint, uh, it might be just an issue with lubrication and, or you can replace it if needed. Uh, worn contours, so if it's 5%, so it gets worn down uh, more than 5% of that total height on your chain, uh, you want to check your alignment, check your clearances, check if there's anything rubbing against it, or if you need some new nylon on, on surfaces. Uh, if you have cracked or fatigued plates, you really want to replace that chain, or if you have a turn pin, you want to replace your chain, and, and, and in any case, uh, improve your lubrication strategy. Uh, you know, I always suggest to farmers as well, I really like to keep uh, spare half links and links 
on their farm. And I want to, I make sure to have one for everything, 40, 60, 80, uh, 50 sometimes. And you want to have, at least try to have a one foot of spare chain. I think it's cheap enough at places like track supply, I buy a 10 foot of chain just to have on hand. Um, and, you know, I think in 60, there's actually, 60 and 80 might have a heavy duty one as well. That'd be good to have a spare if you have that on your equipment. So be 60H, 80H, whatever it may be. Uh, buy, buy the, and I also want to encourage you to buy the appropriate chain break, whether it's uh, a hammer, punch, and a vice, or grinder, or whatever you have. You know, it may work, but it takes more work. So maybe getting the appropriate chain break uh, save you a little bit of headache. Uh, you can lubricate, you know, really lubricate as required, you know, daily, hourly, wherever specified, try to lubricate on the specified schedule. Um, so this is, you know, get some of that more general maintenance, you know, how you put your clips on, you know, go in the direction of your chain, it does matter. Uh, so hopefully if you go in the direction of your chain, be able to put them on and clip them off. Uh, try not to pry them or bend them too much. Hopefully this will save you a little bit of headache. And I also like to have a magnet. I got one of those magnets that are fairly robust. Uh, I forget how many pounds it is, but so I can, whenever that little pen pops off, I can go out there in the grass and actually find it or have spares of those. Because again, having spares might save you a little bit of a uh, hassle as well. Uh, thing about belt maintenance, uh, you know, dry rot, excessive noise, they do have belt conditioners, uh, but if, at some point you might get a loss of tension over time or loss of adju adjustment if it's too stretched. They do have uh, tension gauges and ultrasonic gauges. I generally, like you kind of know what it should be if it's, if you've had it for a while, you should kind of know what it should be. Uh, but if it's breaking, it's going to be over tensioned or over exertion. So there might be some other issues that are taking place within your machinery. Some bearing or something else could be going out. Uh, lubrication is key to keeping things running smoothly. So the manual should be, give you a frequency as far as when you should lubricate your equipment. So grease is cheap, parts are not. So loader bucket, it's just, you know, it has every, it might be every 10 hours. It's one of those things, it's gonna take some time. It's kind of, it's not that bad. Um, this is one that our, our mechanic, tractor mechanic typically told us, he said that front axle, front end is typically ignored. What they typically do is jack up the front of the tractor and then hopefully get that where you can get enough grease all the way around uh, your pen there. So making sure everything's greased. And uh, just because the fitting is missing doesn't mean you don't have to grease it. So uh, replace it. You know, we can replace it. You know, that grease is there to serve a function. And so really, you know, there can be too much of a good thing for some parts and equipment. So follow the guidelines, but, you know, try to move off some of the excess grease, but really, you know, making sure that everything's running smoothly, you know, is on, it's on all of us to make sure we can grease everything in an effective manner according to specifications. Look at your manual, that might help you. Looking at your manual might help you find all the potential grease points on your tractor. Some may, some may require additional help or effort. Some, there are some that just require two people. If you're working on that knuckle on your four-wheel drive, yeah, it's probably gonna require two people. Um, you get uh, bearing failure. So think about bearing failures, uh, excessive loads, overheating, could be normal fatigue, failure, fit alignment, you know, the list, the list goes on as far as the causes. Um, but what you might see is you should see a, a temperature spike, squeak, wobble, whatever it may be uh, on your machinery there. But um, you know, one of the things we can check out is our, our bearing temperature. So a non-contact sensor, or you could, if you have thermal couples that you could attach you know, around it, that could be one way of, of indicating it. Check your adjacent uh, or your opposite side or adjacent or similar bearings compared to temperature on the same shaft uh, to see what could be going on. Temperature can vary based on ambient conditions, load, speed, a lot of different signs. So general science, so that's not mist or that's that smoke. So it could be noise, excessive heat, or fire or smoke. So in this case, you know, it's on a machine here. So it's definitely getting hot. You know, it's got a lot of small grasses in there. So that's, that's one thing about machinery, or the hay machinery is we got some grass, we got some dust, we got some parts and they're heating up. And so, you know, smoke 
and fire is not out of the realm of possibilities. So just want to suggest to you, get a fire extinguisher. No ifs, ands, or buts, you know, just, just get one. Put on your baler, on your tractor, whatever you have, just get one. Um, and, you know, changing uh, some of your fluids, you know, think about our engine oil, you know, it depends on the age of the tractor. Uh, you know, some of you check your manual as far as, you know, when you should do it. I try to do most of mine annually. Uh, a lot of people do it based upon the hours. I'm typically not going really over 400 hours, but uh, with a lot of older tractors that are 1970s, uh, really need to make sure I take care of that whole system. So I, I try to change the oil fairly frequently. Uh, and, and with the waste oil, especially, I think you can wear gloves because there are some phenolic compounds. It's not the oil itself, it's just the phenolic compounds from the engine as it's burning uh, that can get into your oil and, and be, uh, not, be, not be so great, I guess, in the long-term scheme of things from your health standpoint. Uh, there are ways to do a fluid analysis for oil and coolants. You know, maybe for optimum service life. I, I myself have never used this. It can maybe lengthen the interval once you change the oil. What's the contaminates? And so contaminants, maybe you can start knowing when something is heading south. Uh, might be geared towards more of the construction, like dozers, um, excavators, but the oil can give you a base number, fuel set, oxidation. Uh, coolant can be nitrate or um, total dissolved solids. So again, I myself haven't used it, but it is an option that's available, as well as, you know, there's a number of different standards for the tests that you could run. Uh, as far as cleaning out your radiator, uh, you know, typically suggest using compressed airs for newer tractors, especially. Uh, everything seems like it's crammed together. So, you know, clean out that radiator becomes even more important in my mind. Uh, and just the personal protective equipment, just wear a dust mask and eye protection if, if available. So newer equipment. So you shouldn't have as many breakdowns or issues, but things will happen. And the, the pro will be, you know, these tractors do have more safety features. A con is also these things have more safety features. So it's, it can be annoying at times, but you know, we have to be safe when we're doing this. But in this picture, we got probably a brand new tractor we're renting and we probably got about a, I don't know, less than a half mile from the dealership. And it felt like it was raining on a, on a bright sunny day. And it turned out the rain was actually hydraulic fluid. It busted a line, had less than 50 hours. So, you know, it shouldn't happen, shouldn't have as many issues, but, you know, you can, with, even with newer tracks, you can have issues. Um, and then the safety features, every time with that tractor, every time your butt lifted a little bit out of the seat, man, it would scream and yell and have whistles going off. And so uh, sometimes they can be good, you know, because it's, it's keeping you safe, but sometimes it can be somewhat annoying. Uh, so ease operation. You know, definitely the newer tractors, you have a lot more conveniences. It's, it's not definitely more ergonomic, a little better viewing. It's definitely a better, a better tractor if you can afford such a thing. Uh, and they, they should have, a, you know, modern controls, different, a new monitor. Definitely uh, should be a lot more better to use. But there, there's, a, there's a thinking question. There's an off, uh, some, another part of this is, is a, a thinking question is that, you know, who owns a tractor? And I think, you know, for the longest time, it's pretty simple. It's whoever puts the money down. So it'd be the bank, the last bidder, dad, mom, spouse, uncle, brother, whoever, you know, owns a tractor. But then you think about who owns your phone. And you think, you know, I do. Well, that's until you need to be, get it repaired. Then I think Apple says otherwise. So one of these two retractors here, you know, on the right, is going to require software to run. And so, you know, one of the things, you know, that brings up is uh, the right to repair. And so it really, in my, you know, it's, you know, we think about it's only a problem for people with new machinery, but in my mind and simplistically, and it kind of, it just boils down to money. It boils down to money, it's scheduling conflict and who's, who's in charge of the um, liabilities if we allow for the right to repair. So. Uh, what they want you to do is actually take it to a dealership to get it repaired for some of the newer equipment. So for the newer equipment, they want you to get it taken to a dealership and only to a dealership to get work done. 
Well, obviously there's gonna be issues with downtime, scheduling conflicts, and maybe it takes more money when you actually take it to the dealership. Maybe that's why you're trying to go to a third party. However, from the large corporations, so John Deere, Case, whoever it may be, these companies, they don't want you messing with the emissions, safety um, of the machines. They don't want you modifying the code. So there's it's kind of this catch-22. I was like, well, who really owns it? They're saying this is now more a software device as opposed to machine. So there's, you know, there's Nebraska, California, different states, you know, they're trying to restrict or they're trying to change it so that we have the right to repair uh, machinery. That's, you know, some of the newer machinery. So maybe no resetting the mobilizer system. So there's different things, but you can't mess with the missions, but maybe, they, maybe they'll eventually allow third parties access to the code to know what the fault is, what fault's being triggered and how to reset that, that uh, trigger. So right to repair is a little old, uh, right to repair is taking place, you know, across the United States, the different states are trying to enact legislation. Nonetheless, the future of ag is going to become more software dep dependent, more and more dependent on software. Um, automation is going to take place. Repair might not be an issue because, you know, if we think from uh, Professor Ohio State suggests that it may be more like your, um, you know, back in the day. So I still got the tractor from my dad had from 1976. But uh, they said that might change in the future where we might have a tractor four or five or six years it becomes outdated and we just replace it. So it might be made to, made to replace, made to upgrade like a phone and maybe not necessarily to repair. So that could be the future of agriculture. This one's completely auto <clears throat> automated system that they had at the farm show uh, two years ago. <clears throat> so, you know, speaking of uh, shifting gears a little bit, you know, is that, you know, trying to think about, you know, if we have our tractor, we're spending some money here, you know, trying to save some money, you know, find filter sales. So I think Wix just had one, at least in our area, the Wix had one, Napa or auto parts store, wherever it should have a filter sale. So it could be just 50% off filters. It makes the justification for changing filters a lot easier. And I like to shop around for at least the readily available parts as alternators and starters, because, um, a lot of your original equipment manufacturers, you know, might be charging a lot more than if you get at the auto place or a manufactured shop. Um, these are actual examples for the alternator, but um, yeah, definitely get it remanufactured it can cost you a lot, save you a whole lot of money, uh, potentially. Uh, so jumping in a little bit of economics, uh, so just a couple more slides here. I'd be remiss if I didn't include any of the economics, but uh, now, giving a shout out to Greg Halich's uh, custom machinery rates for applicable to Kentucky. Uh, so this is 2019 numbers, but they're two dollars fifty cents a gallon. So I think it's pretty much going to apply here. But we're looking at our our, uh, our average, and so it's going to change a little bit here and there. But uh, you know, what's our rates for you know cutting, mowing, cutting, tedding uh, for small square bales? Your cost per baling, complete harvest. For your, your small square bale, haylage, large square baling, uh, uh, per bale, uh, large square bales, and then your round bales as well. So maybe you go up to your bigger bales, $13 per bale with net wrap. Uh, so these, these are pretty good. Uh, you know, if you don't know your costs, uh, these are some maybe some averages to use. Uh, so an example of using custom machine rates, if we were to use this on, uh, one of, one of my fields, so I was able to cut this field. So one of them is without fertilizer, uh, 20 acres. I didn't fertilize it at all. I haven't fertilized in a while. Uh, got 16 bales. So bales per acre is 0.8 bales. So the cost of mowing and conditioning was, you know, 1550 according to their sheet. And then the cost of raking, $7.50. So I spent according to $60 on this. And the cost of mowing and raking per bale was $28. So spreading that cost of that 20 acres over very few bales uh, cost me $28. Whereas in another case, I spent $1,200 on fertilizer. So on 15 acres, but directly adjacent. Only thing separate them is a stream. Uh, so it's 40, I got 43 bales, almost three bales per acre. 
uh, mowing cost $15 per acre. And so $7 per acre, so 233 and 113 respectively. And so my cost per bale, $8. So, you know, we get to decide how much our yield is. And so this is, this was, you know, just an example of like, I pulled those costs off his sheet, but, you know, comparing the two, uh, this is two, uh, this is uh, 2020 yields. So the difference there, so taking the fertilizer into consideration. So we just look at the difference there. So the difference between the 0.8 acres and the 2.9, so the 2.1 bales per acre. Just look at the difference. So over those 15 acres, you know, what, the, what did that additional yield from a fertilizer standpoint cost me? So that difference is $15 per, uh, 15 acres, 31 bale. I got the additional 31 bales compared to when I applied no fertilizer, made that investment. So my cost per bale, so I bought bales, uh, I pretty much paid $40.77 for those additional bales. But, you know, spreading across, you know, if I, I took that same math and I think about, well, I actually got the whole 43 bales, but spreading across all 43, you know, looking at that increased fertilizer cost, I'm getting that, that 2940 as my cost per bale from that fertilizer across all the bales. So there's a difference between the two and then uh, the cost per bale. So taking that into account, so really we we're, we're trying to know our costs. And so without fertilizer, you know, that 20 acres, you know, for that total field, I spent $668 uh, total cost per acre, you know, I include about $13 here. $13 was for the cost per bale of um, my bailing cost. So that was included into this. And then like without fertilizer, with that fertilizer cost, my total field cost is about $144 per acre compared to 33. My cost per bale was $50.42 compared to the 41. Now, I know what you're thinking there. Well, it sounds like you just don't need to fertilize. Well, that's not that, eh, more or less, but I, in essence, I had bought hay here. And I, I was essentially buying hay here. Uh, and these are the bigger bales. So these are five by six bales. So this actually tracks. So, you know, your four by fives be about maybe $25. So it does track with uh, what the price of people getting last year. But you know, thinking about it, you know, how long, you know, I, I have cows and I was feeding over winter, so I, just my big mama cows were eating two bales a day. Well, those 16 bales are gonna last me barely a week. Um, whereas 40, 44, you know, that's gonna give me, uh, give me, give me a little bit of time. So that gives me three weeks. So really, really, you know, with the fertilizers, just figuring out, how much we're, we're buying hay, essentially. I'm buying hay. So, you know, and I, I think that's one of the things they said at the alfalfa conference. You, you can decide to some degree, you know, it's gonna be weather dependent, but you can decide your yields and, or you can set a goal for your yields. And so really that's what we we're doing, you know, deciding we want to, you know, wanted to have cows. It's like, that was our goal for yields. And I really didn't feel that bad about it. You know, $50 per acre, $50 per bale because, I had bought some, was a hay in 2019. I had bought some hay and I got, I got low. It got drawn us in late in uh, 2019. It was a 20, 20 we'll say 2019, but uh, it might've been 2018. But when we had that drought, we had that drought in late, late fall, what happened was I had to go buy hay and that was hay that was stored outside, wasn't the best quality and it was $70 a bale. And that's when I had to decide, you know, do I want to have cows or, or not? And so I, when, I, when I had to pay, pay $70 a bale for crap hay in December, I decided, you know, it's probably better to spend it on fertilizer and try to get it up when it's good, high quality, you know, relatively good quality fescue clover mix as opposed to getting whatever somebody else had bailed. And that was $70 and I had to transport too. So, you know, know your costs, know what you want to do. And, you know, this can be lower. If I did more hay, I could actually reduce my cost per bale as well. So really, you know, it doesn't matter what, you know, you really need to know your cost. This is a percent of dry matter. So your nitrogen, phosphorus, K, uh, calcium, magnesium for your different fields. And for, 
the different crops, excuse me. And so what we can look at here, if we have a 1500 pound bale, this would be the amount of pounds in a bale of each one of those nutrients, according to that chart. And so from that, so I don't know, uh, I talked to Philip about it, but you know, the cost per bale, you know, seeing what's happened here of late, you know, uh, it's, it's gonna go up and it's, I'd say it's, it'd be easy to apply a line, but that's about it, I think this year. <laughs> Because uh, we've seen everything go up, you know, corn's definitely looking a lot better for them per bushel. And so we see this, you know, 2021, you know, urea went from 390 to 470. DAP, and this is the DAP price I got this past week, it was, went from 450 last year to 640. Uh, went from 370 to 450 on potash. Lime, haven't really got a price on lime, but I think it's pretty much the same. Uh, so we think about that from our, our crop standpoint, you know, if we got alfalfa, it gets its own nitrogen source, but, you know, it looks like a combined, combined value of those nutrients is $39 uh, for your five by six. Um, $39, you know, you look at it for your other crops, it's, it's anywhere from $29, $22 to $30 for your fescue and orchard grass. <laughs> fescue and orchard grass. That nutrient value is a uh, Thirty-seven, thirty-nine. So this is just the nutrient value, just nutrient value. When you take into account those harvesting costs, so you add additional twenty-five, thirty dollars for your twenty-five dollars, give or take, for your uh, har machinery harvesting costs. Well, now that bale, that five by six bale, is now worth about sixty dollars. So you know, really knowing your costs and knowing what value you have is really important. Uh, so that's why I said, you know, we're really, what we're doing, Dad always said, we're really just service mining. We're just pulling nutrients out of the soil in the form of grasses. So we're really just service mining. We just got to, but we have to apply um, those values as needed. And so, you know, question is, you know, soil sample, you know, I get out there right now and do it. You know, this is the time, figure out what you need. And, you know, maybe, maybe it'd be the year to apply lime and maybe hold off on some of them or, or think, but it's gonna be fairly challenging or, or really prioritize what fields you wanna do. But, uh, you know, question, questions to ask, you know, prior to getting some equipment. So, you know, re really thinking about it, you know, what, what type of operations you have? What crop do you have? What crop, you know, are you getting alfalfa, fescue, and number of acres? You know, what, question to ask prior to getting up any forage or hay equipment. What is the end user of your hay? So most of the time I've been talking about, and I personally have cattle, but if it's horse or goat, you know, then you're really, really that there's no question of whether you get a tether. You have to get a tether. You know, maybe with cattle, you can maybe get away without it using them, but horse or goat, they want it to be pristine, no mold. Uh, you're probably about better go ahead and make another, uh, make a, that cattle don't need a high quality hay, but uh, the horse and goat people are willing to pay you, actually pay you money for it, so. Uh, and how much dry hay will you handle it is another question to ask. Like how much, how much hay do you need to, to get you through the year? How do you, how do you plan to handle hay after you harvest it? Because once you, if you got square bales and round bales, next thing is to get it from the field into storage or somewhere where it won't necessarily spoil as much. So that's another factor to consider. Uh, spoilage does take place. You're going to get maybe 5% storage even when you store it indoors. And when you store it outside, it can be from five to 20%, depending on how tight your bale is, if it's net wrap, it should shed a little better, whatever it is. So thinking about how do you, how do you handle it after you harvest it? What's the size of your tractor are available for the task? How you're, how you are you replacing or adding new harvesting equipment? You know, what are you, are you looking to change out something or what's your, what's your goal, I guess, on number five? Uh, how much are you currently spending on your fuel for your hay operation? So that can be another another concern um, that you have to address as a more efficient way to do it. Uh, how fast do you need to get the hay done? Does it fit into the rest of your operation? So that's one, that's one I'll kind of address on the next slide. Is like, does it really work for your operation? Uh, maybe, you know, do you have additional labor to help you with cutting the hay? <clears throat> yes, no. And sometimes, you know, my brother's helping me out. I was like, I wish I didn't have help. So at least they wouldn't have gone, dropped in a hole. 
but uh, <clears throat> and and why you know can you justify do you need a conditioner if you have plenty of time maybe you don't need a conditioner if it's July probably don't need it but you know if you do and I, I strongly suggest you get a conditioner what's your preference for conditioners and I, I'd again lean towards personal preference disclaimer of, of rollers and then uh, but I do have a flow conditioner prefer a roller but I have a flail um, and how much do you want to spend you know that's that's the end of the day it's like how much can you spend and then uh, thinking about something, you know, what type of operation do you have? And I asked this to producers, Dave, do you have a hay operation or do you have a livestock operation? And some people say both, I got both. Can you effectively manage both? That's just a question to ask. And sometimes you don't necessarily have to produce hay. You know, at some point, that's where I think it's really knowing your numbers. What can you do acres per hour, cutting, raking, rolling? What is your fuel use? What is your nutrient use? What's your costs per bale, per acre? So somebody else can produce the hay for $10 a bale. They're willing to produce it for $10 a bale or $20 a bale. So be it. Buy hay from them. If it's a quality hay that works for your livestock, you know, I think it'd almost be worth it if you're a livestock operation yeah, maybe save yourself on a lot of equipment costs, maybe some of your fertilizer costs and just have someone else, uh, maybe not your fertilizer, you still have to apply fertilizer, but have someone else do the hay for you. Like you don't necessarily have to do it all. If there's somebody who is effective and just, just keep in mind though, you know, one of the reasons that we rationalize doing our own hay is because when I do my hay, I do my hay first and then I worry about everybody else because I put the nutrients down. I've done this, I've done that. So I, I think I understand where there's rationalization where you want to um, maybe do your own just because that you don't wanna be left short on the list and they get to your hay in July when it's pretty much useless at that point. Then you have to find another way to supplement the feed and nutrients to your animals. So really knowing your costs. And so, you know, weather survey says, you know, really we're all still going to be dependent on the weather. Uh, 40 to 60%, you know, means different things, different times of the years. And, you know, for that, I wish you the best of luck. Um, I'd like to open up for any questions. I, I can't see the chat. But... Okay, guys, if you have any questions, put them in the chat. Uh, I do have one doc. Going back to the picture of the tool that you use to measure the chain length stretch whatever you want to call it what's that tool called and where do you find it um let's see here Chain. while he's looking for that april uh put the what? link for the website for the the weather uk weather into the chat so if you scroll back up or you can find it too okay uh so the roller chain um elongation let me see the Chain wear gauge is what they have on there on the thing itself. It's a chain wear gauge. Um, and it's something you know you can search for and you don't necessarily have to have one of those. You can actually just measure between the lengths. And I think those are a little, those are a lot easier to use, but if you measure between the lengths and kind of give you an estimation of, uh, of how much you know your chain is elongating and when you need to replace it. And you know something I didn't mention. Yeah, I didn't mention was uh, I see I did see one comment was a drum rollers. I didn't I did not mention drum rollers. They're they are cheaper than discs. They can be dependable. They um, ASAB specification for drums requires uh, slightly more horsepower. I think for drum mowers uh, than than your traditional disc. And it, but it'll vary. I've seen studies uh, for the, between the drum and a disc. That go back and forth. So, uh, if you have a drum drum mower, but traditionally, I think people have a disc or a cutter bar. Okay, sounds great. I do know we have some drum rollers uh, in the county, uh, so they do get used. Next, a uh, little housekeeping thing: if you are logged in as iPad four person, if you don't care to put your name in the chat or send me an email if you want credit for tonight. Uh, and while we're waiting on some more questions, I do have an announcement. Uh, in response to the recent ice storm and flooding, 
uh, the Boyd, Carter, Greenup, and Lawrence County Extension Office are organizing a storm relief effort to benefit local farmers. They realized the ice storm left many without power and anemones for several days and took large areas of farm fencing when large trees and limbs either broke or were uprooted that fell on the fence. As local farmers are slowly beginning to get out from underneath that catastrophic widespread flooding began. The flood was made worse by the debris from the ice storm that the flood waters washed away, where much of it clogged, where much of it clogged up gutters and lodged under bridges, it forced water to back up and find its way around. They are in the process of collecting hay feed fencing supplies to distribute to local farmers who were impacted by the recent weather events. If you are in one of these counties and your farm sustained damage and would like to request supplies, reach out to your local county agent. If you are not impacted and have fencing supplies, hay, bag feed, or even bedding for horses that could be donated, it would help tremendously. No, no donations too large or too small. We have facilities to handle tractor trailer loads of hay and other supplies or just a few posts. All donations will be collected and distributed from the Boyd County Fairgrounds. They accept financial donations to the local extension office as well. And if you have uh, any questions or comments or anything like that, I will put their contact name contacts into the chat. And I still don't see any questions. Um, we're going to call that a, a wrap. Okay. Mike Dixon is, uh, thanks, Mike. I appreciate uh, you telling me who you are. Uh, Doc, I do appreciate uh, you taking time tonight and going into some good information on hay equipment. Next week, we are going to have uh, Dr. Jimmy Henning, and we're going to do a deep dive into baleage or haylage. With no other questions, uh, I'll hang around for a few minutes, Doc, if you don't care to hang around for a few minutes if something else kind of comes in. Uh, but we will call tonight good. I appreciate it.